Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, next episode. Let's do it. 1066 and the Norman Conquest. If you haven't watched number seven, I would recommend, but that is up to you. Let's do it. If you're new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video is at the top of the, de of the description below. Blah. And right under that is the Discord link. Just click on it. It'll send you right over there. Love to have you. Let's do it. If you're not ready to learn, you're in the wrong class. Arthur Canute didn't have any heirs. 1042, and England is without a king. The last king, Arthur Canute, didn't have any heirs, so in the previous year he had invited Edward, the son of the last Anglo-Saxon king, Ethelred II, from his exile in Normandy to stay at the English court. Shortly after the death of Harthur Canute, Edward was chosen as king by the previous Ed, year Ed, he sorry, had invited okay. Edward, the son of the last Anglo-Saxon king, Ethelred II, from his exile in Normandy to stay at the English court. Shortly after the death of Harthur Canute, Edward was chosen as king by the nobles, notably by Earl Godwin of Wessex, the most powerful in the kingdom. There were several other claimants though, such as Edward, the son of Edmund Ironside, as well as King Magnus of Norway, who had just succeeded Harthur Canute to the Danish throne. Edward's reign marks the high point of Anglo-Saxon administration, which is best demonstrated by a new form of legal document, the writ. Edward was not the first king to use a writ, but he did use them widely. The writ was a short notice that lands had been traded which was sent to Shire Reeves to be authenticated and witnessed. All of this relied on a detailed record-keeping system and a well-trained bureaucracy which regularly assessed the values of land. The assessment of lands was the foundation for the English army, which over the previous century had become more professional. For every five hides of land, a single fully equipped soldier had to be provided. Five hides were the minimum amount of land a man could possess to become a thane, so every thane had to provide at least one soldier for the English army. Okay, so if you had enough land to a certain point, you had to provide a, an equipped soldier to the army. Okay, that makes sense. Equipping a soldier was expensive, so this created a prestigious warrior class. Edward, better known as Edward the Confessor, is one of the few English kings that became a saint due to his piety in that he was believed to be able to miraculously heal the sick. He ordered the construction of a great abbey in London, Westminster Abbey, which was designed by Norman architects using a continental building style. As king, Edward had a lot of say over church matters, such as the appointing of bishops and archbishops, and this was the beginning of one of his reign's most important events. In 1050, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Aidsiger, died, and in 1050... So this guy, the Archbishop of Canterbury, is essentially the Pope's representative in England, I believe. One, a monk called Ethelrich, was chosen by the monks of Canterbury to succeed him. Edward forbid this from happening and appointed a Norman called Robert to the position instead, which angered Earl Godwin since Ethelrich was a relative of his. In order to become the Archbishop, Robert had to collect what was called a pallium, a symbol of his office, from Rome personally. It is argued by Norman sources that whilst on his way, Robert stopped off in Normandy and told William, the Duke of Normandy, that since Edward had no heirs, he wished for William to succeed him. Now, this is debated fiercely, but it lays the foundation for William's later claim to the throne of England. Edward, in order yeah. to secure a continental alliance, received Count Eustace of Boulogne, which is here, as a guest in 1051. He gave Eustace some land in Dover, and upon his arrival there, Eustace got into a quarrel with the locals and some people were killed. Edward blamed the locals and so ordered Godwin to harry, that is, devastate it, as punishment. Godwin refused because he owned a significant portion of Dover and didn't want to break his own stuff. Godwin thus raised an army against the king, and the king summoned Seward, the Hold Earl of Didac, so... a guest in 1050. To secure a continental alliance, received Count Eustace of Boulogne, which is here, as a guest in 1051. Okay. He gave Eustace some land in Dover, and upon his arrival there, Eustace got into a quarrel with the locals, and some people were killed. Edward blamed the locals, and so ordered Godwin to harry, that is, devastate it, as punishment. Godwin refused because he owned a significant portion of Dover and didn't want to break his own stuff. Okay. Godwin thus raised an army against the king, and the king summoned Seward, the Earl of Northumbria, and Leofric, the Earl of Mercia, against him. Side note about Leofric, he is most famous for his part in the legend of his wife, Lady Godiva. The legend goes that Leofric okay. was oppressive, and his wife asked him to lessen the taxes on the poor. Leofric told Godiva that he would do this on the condition that she would ride through the town naked, which she promptly did. So, folklore aside, England was on the brink- They say Peeping Tom, that's where the term- condition that she ride through the town naked, which she promptly did. So, folklore aside, England was on the brink of civil war until Godwin's support collapsed and he was forced to flee and he was never seen again. Just kidding, so Godwin returned the next year with a fleet and demanded concessions from the king, such as the banishment of the Archbishop Robert as well as some of the Normans at court. The king acquiesced and Godwin returned to his earldom with one of his loyal men, Stigand, becoming Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Winchester. 
Godwin's triumph wouldn't last since he died in 1053, but his son, Harold, commonly known as Harold Godwinson, because shockingly he was the son of Godwin, succeeded his father as the Earl of Wessex. Okay. Harold's position was entrenched okay. further when his brother Tostig became the Earl of Northumbria in 1055, and at roughly the same time another of his brothers, Geirth, was made the Earl of East Anglia. Tostig wouldn't last forever as the Earl of Northumbria, though, since he was driven out by the people there in 1065. A man called Morcar was made Earl of Northumbria, who was the younger brother of Edwin, the Earl of Mercia. Thus, by the end of 1065, the four major earldoms were split between two powerful families. In the same year, it is said that Harold went to Normandy in behalf of the now sick Edward to uphold the earlier promise that William was to succeed as King of England. On January the 6th, 1066... So, Harold... Families. So, you had East Anglia, Mercia, Northumbria, and Wessex. You got Wessex and East Anglia against uh, Mercia, Northumbria. And Harold, who's the Earl of Wessex went to Norman, to the Norman area, on behalf of the king. In the same year, it is said that Harold went to Normandy in behalf of the now sick Edward to uphold the earlier promise that William was to succeed as king of England. To get On them. January the 6th, 1066, King Edward the Confessor died. On the same day, Harold Godwinson was crowned King Harold II. He may have been crowned king, but there was no guarantee that he would stay king. What was guaranteed now was that there would be a battle between the claimants to the kingdom. There were only two rivals to Harold, the first being William and the second being the King of Norway, Harold Hardrada, whose claim was based upon an alleged agreement that had been made with Hardicanut. The English began preparing for William's coming invasion and King Harold had his army camp in the southern shires. Unfortunately for him, Hardrada landed on the Northumbrian coast on the 18th of September, helped by the exiled Tostig. The Earls of Mercia in Northumbria met Hardrada at the Battle of Fulford on September the 20th. The Norwegians were victorious and soon after Hardrada was in control of York. Godwinson soon after marched his army north at an incredible rate and on September the 25th both kings fought at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. The English were victorious and during the fighting Hudrada was killed due to being shot through the neck with an arrow. Godwinson and his army were given little time to recover since on either the 28th or the 29th of September William's fleet and army landed here. Howard rushes exhausted army down south to meet William. On October the 14th... Alright, what I'm confused here is I thought Harold was the one who went down to tell William about the crown is isn't that the case i I'll, I'll, i'm at 452 but i have to i was at 452 was split between two powerful families in the same year it is said that harold went to normandy in behalf of the now sick edward to uphold the earlier promise that william was to succeed as king of england so this is harold who's the earl of wessex who's trying to tell william that he's still the king, but Harold is going to end up taking the the crown when um, Edward dies. England. On and then he's going to end up fighting this guy who he's telling is the heir. Okay, um, I was here. Cumbrian coast on the 18th Battle of Fulford on September the 20th. The Norwegians were victorious, and soon after, Hardrada was in control of York. I was around Godwinson here. soon after marched his army north at an incredible rate, and on September the 25th, both kings fought at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. The English were victorious, and during the fighting, Hardrada was killed due to being shot through the neck with an arrow. Godwinson and his army were given little time to recover, since on either the 28th or the 29th of September, William's fleet and army landed here. Howard rushes exhausted army down south to meet William. On October the 14th, they clashed at the famous Battle of Hastings, in which Godwinson was killed. Obi Wan the Kenobi. Best source from the period is the so, in a way, Harold screwed over himself by going earlier when Edward was still alive to tell William that he was still the heir? Or am I missing something? History. It was probably commissioned by William's half brother Otto and was made in England, not Bayo. It also isn't a tapestry, but an embroidery, meaning that in a name consisting of two words, both are lies. William awaited the English to proclaim him as his king, but instead many nobles backed a native called Edgar, who was the grandson of a previous king, Edmund Ironside. This initial resistance did not achieve much, and William soon accepted London's surrender, and by late October most of the English nobles had given up. William was crowned King of England at Westminster Abbey on December the 25th, although the coronation had its hiccups. When asked if they wanted William as their king, the people outside the abbey all cheered in English, which the Norman guards couldn't understand, and according to William of Potier, the guards thought that the shouting boded some ill, and without reason, they started to set fire to the city. The coronation oh, was still complete, no. and it was always to be remembered as the one with the most arson. William did not stay in England arson. long, and in 1067, he returned to Normandy in triumph, leaving his brother, Oddo, in charge. 
There were many revolts against Norman rule in the wake of the conquest. One of the most famous rebels is a man called Heriwith the Wake, who led a guerrilla-style campaign against the Normans from Ely, which included slaughtering knights and looting Peterborough Abbey with the help of some Danes. Rebellion was intermittent. Didn't he read the faces of the people and be like, they're... They're rebelling against us. Well, they look pretty happy. It's no... Okay. Which included slaughtering knights and looting Peterborough Abbey with the help of some Danes. Rebellion was intermittent over the next couple of years, but the Normans were able to effectively deal with them due to one innovation that the Normans had brought with them. Castle. The Normans used a specific type of castle called a mott and bailey, which shockingly consisted of a bailey, which was a fortified courtyard sitting next to a mott, which was a large earthen mound with a keep on top. They were designed to allow the Norman soldiers and nobles to live among their subjects from a defensible position, and if their subjects got a bit rebellious, the soldiers could simply go out, crush them, and return to safety. In 1068, William appointed a man called Robert Comyn as the Earl of Northumbria, but the next year, he and his guards were murdered by the locals. Unsurprisingly, William was furious, and so began an infamous period in British history known as the Harrying of the North, which involved Norman troops under William undertaking a scorched earth policy. They burned crops, attacked peasants, and destroyed villages in order to flush out the rebels who refused to meet William in battle. The results were devastating for the North, and it is believed that over 100,000 people were killed in the several months it lasted. So, it's hard to overstate the colossal effect that the Norman Conquest had on the Kingdom of England and the people that lived there. In order to promote continuity, William at first tried to continue issuing writs in Old English, but it wasn't long before it was replaced by Latin. He did continue the Geld, though, since it was extremely lucrative, but for the most part, the attempts at continuity were short-lived. The ruling class of England was for all intents and purposes eradicated, with very few maintaining their positions in the decade after the conquest. William saw that the overwhelming majority of the English nobility was replaced by his closest friends and allies. Within ten years of the conquest, no Englishman held an earldom, only one English bishop remained, and over 90% of land had been confiscated for redistribution. William appointed a man called Lanfranc as the new Archbishop of Canterbury. Lanfranc's main change was to begin the curtailing of the reverence of Anglo-Saxon saints. Culturally, the change was massive too. Old English names such as the Ethelreds, the Edgeberts, and the Leofrics were replaced with Roberts, Henrys, and Williams. Women were stripped of the rights they were entitled to under Anglo-Saxon law, and the free peasants, the churls, lost much of their status as well. This does not mean that the English were entirely unimportant. It is likely that Englishmen made up most of the warrior class, and may be the reason why the English word knight continued to be used instead of its French equivalent, chevalier. Architecture also saw a massive overhaul, with the stoic Anglo-Saxon features being replaced by the much more extravagant Romanesque architecture the Normans had brought with them. So were there any benefits? Yes, some. The Norman conquest would eventually lead to the abolition of slavery, which was very common in Anglo-Saxon England. The Norman nobles felt that slavery was barbaric and it soon fell out of fashion and would eventually disappear within 50 years. The Normans also had a very competent government, and their efforts culminated in the creation of the Doomsday Book in 1086, which was a survey of England's wealth and is one of the most important sources for the period. For the most part, the lives of the peasantry remained unchanged, and the Normans, along with their Flemish allies, were able to prevent a great deal of Viking raiding, and by 1085, the genuine threat of a Viking takeover was history. Of course, arguably the greatest consequence of the Norman takeover was that the affairs of England and France would be, from 1066 onwards, closely intertwined. Since from that point forward, the Duke of Normandy, a subject of the French king, was now the king of a wealthier, separate kingdom which would only lead to conflict. This conflict and those that came after would drastically alter the course of history for both of these kingdoms for the next thousand So this is when the, all the beef between France and England starts is because the successful invasion of William from Normandy or the Norman territory in France, which is technically under French rule, obviously, and now he's the king of England. Okay. Years. Prior to Hastings, the kingdoms of England and France had been on good terms. William may have won in the end, but had Howard Hardrada simply turned up a mere three weeks later, England could have become a very different nation. It would not be an exaggeration to call October the 14th, 1066 the most important date in English history. There have been many events of immense importance, but the dates of them will slip most people's minds, but not Hastings. 1066 is a date that will forever be burned into the English consciousness. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you for watching. There are some book recommendations. Awesome video. I think I did pretty well, actually, understanding that. Yeah, let, or let me know if I didn't, honestly, Ob obviously. Um, hope you guys are doing well. If not, that sucks, but you'll be fine soon. Don't worry. Uh, next episode coming soon. Subscribe, hit all the buttons. See you next time.